Very thankful to be here with you all, and I'm very excited to share the Word of God with you, for I have been praying and asking the Lord to give me a message that would be relevant for His people today. And I believe the Lord has answered that prayer, and it's a very practical study. And so I believe that we will all be edified as long as we have ears to hear. And so the best way I believe for God to give us the right type of hearing that we can hear these spiritual words that the Lord is going to speak through his word, the best way to prepare our hearts to receive that is on our knees. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to kneel to pray. And if you can, please join me in kneeling. But if you cannot kneel, then just bow your heads where you are. But let's all reverently approach the Lord together in prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, so much for the privilege to worship you today in spirit and in truth. We thank you, dear God, for the opportunity to hear your words as you give them to us through the Holy Scripture. Lord, I pray that you'll please forgive us of our sins, that you'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and that you'll bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit, that he may come and open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your word. Make your gospel practical to us today and help us to leave here different and better than when we came in. And Lord, while you will bless so many others, I pray, please do not pass me by. Help me to receive a fresh revelation of your word as I seek to give it to your people is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like for you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation 13. And you're going to find that this is a Bible study. There will not be any PowerPoint today, at least as it relates to the screen. I'm just simply asking God for power, and he's going to point me to the scripture. So we're going to Revelation, the 13th chapter, and we are going to see what the word of God has to say to all of us. And I'm going to ask you to please simply let me know when you get there by saying amen. You're going to Revelation 13. We are looking at... Revelation 13, we're going to start at chapter 1. And the Bible says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and how much of the world? It says, and all the world. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. The Bible makes it very clear that there was a beast power that was in existence, the position of the Seventh-day Adventist church, and not simply the Seventh-day Adventist church, the position of the Protestant faith was understood that this beast being spoken of in Revelation 13.1 was none other than the papacy. And therefore, there was a time that it had a tremendous great existence and dominance within the world. But then what happened was the Bible says it suffered a deadly wound. And then the Bible prophesies by telling us that the deadly wound will be healed. We do not believe that the wound is healed, but we believe the healing process has certainly begun. But the reality that is concerning, I would imagine not only to me, but to you, is that the Bible says what will happen when the wound is healed. It said how much of the world? It says all of the world will wonder after the beast. Now, when I think about all of the world, it did not say all of the worldlings. It did not say all of the worldly people. It said all of the world. It's dealing with people who occupy a certain place. In this context, it's talking about earth. And it says that all of those on earth will worship and bow down and admonish this beast. And I have a concern with that because I'm a child of God and I believe you are too. And if we look at this verse and we see that all the world is going to wonder after the beast, does that mean that you're going to wonder after the beast? Does that mean that I'm going to wonder after the beast? God forbid. Now, we're in the world, but we're not of it. Amen. So I think we need to qualify what this is saying when it says all the world will wonder after the beast. So now let's go to the book of Revelation 17. 
If you go to Revelation, the 17th chapter, we get a little bit more balance and understanding. What do you mean all the world will wonder after the beast? Is it really everybody? I believe the answer is no, and I base that upon the scripture. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, the 17th chapter. If you're there, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in Revelation 17, starting at verse 8, it says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. So here goes a group of people on the earth that's wondering after the beast. So this is very much connected to what we read in Revelation 13, people who are wondering after the beast. But notice the qualifier of this group. It goes on to say, yes, the, those who dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So those who will wonder after the beast are those whose names are not written in the book of life. Now, the Bible describes even more who it is whose names are not written in the book of life as we go back to Revelation 13. So let's go there again. And now let's understand it even more. I believe God wants to make these points clear to us today because today is decision time. Today is decision time. There's some decisions that we all are going to have to make. And I believe God's word needs to assist us in making the right decision versus the wrong. The Bible gave a picture that tells us about a beast power that once exalted and ruled the world. But the reality was is that though it exalted in itself and ruled all over the world, it was going to suffer a deadly wound. But the wound would be healed. But the problem was when the wound is healed, it says all the world are going to wonder after this beast. But now we understand it's not really everybody in the world, but it's everybody whose names are what? Are not written in the book of life. Now, the Bible goes on even further with this picture as we go back to Revelation 13. And now let's look at verse 8. The Bible says in Revelation 13, going at verse 8 now, it says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall do what with the beast? It says they shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So these are a group of people whose names are not written in the book of life and whoever's name is not written in the book of life, the Bible says you will worship the beast. You're not just going to wonder and stand in amazement, but the Bible says we're actually going to worship this beast. And what exactly is it that we're going to worship in relation to this beast? We're in Revelation 13 again, but now we're going to start at verse 11. And let's notice more contextually now what it really means about worshiping this beast power. It says in Revelation 13, starting at verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to do what? worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not do what? worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So connected with wandering after the beast, connected with worshiping the beast is also receiving the mark of the beast. I want you to catch that. The Bible is presenting a picture to you and I. There was a time that the papacy had world dominance. But the Bible also prophesied that there will be a time where it was going to suffer a deadly wound. But the Bible continued to prophesy by saying, but that wound will be healed. And when the wound is healed, the Bible says all the world will wonder. But not only will they wonder, they will worship the beast. And not only will they worship the beast, they'll receive the mark of the beast. And as a result of this, their names will not be written in the Lamb's book of life. This becomes a crisis for the people of God. Would you agree? It is because of this that I believe we need to understand, Lord, 
by your grace, how can I make sure that I don't fall into this category? How can I make sure that I'm not counted amongst those who profess to know and worship God and yet will end up worshiping the beast and his image and receive his mark? And ultimately, my name is going to be blotted out of the book of life. You see, there are only two things that God wants to blot out right now. Jesus is in heaven, but not simply heaven. He is in the heavenly sanctuary. And in there, there is a place called the most holy place. And the work that's being done in the most holy place is a blotting out work. And when we think about the blotting out work, there's only one of two things that get blotted out according to the Bible. And let me show you what they are. Go to the book of Acts chapter three. There are only two things that are going to be blotted out. And I want you to see what the Bible says in Acts chapter three. The Bible says in the book of Acts, the third chapter. And now we're going to consider verse 19. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, and I'm speaking to people who, are, who care and are concerned about their own soul salvation, but not only yours, but those whom you know and whom you love. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 3, as we now consider verse 19, the Bible says in Acts 3, 19, repent ye therefore and be converted that your what? That your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. So according to Acts 3 and 19, what is it that we see gets blotted out? Sin. But now let's go to the book of Exodus 32. The second thing that gets blotted out. Right now, Jesus is in heaven. He's in the sanctuary in heaven. He is specifically in the most holy place in heaven. And in there, there is a blotting out work that's being done. And only one of two things get blotted out. Either sins or or something else. The Bible says in the book of Exodus 32 what that something else is. And if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 32, and I want you to see what it says as we look at verse 30. The Bible says in Exodus 32 and verse 30, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Verse 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So there's only one of two things that gets blotted out of the book of life. It is either our sins or our names. That's the only thing that gets blotted out. It's not that a person is in the book. That's not even sensible. But names get written in the book of life. But God wants us to understand that either one of two things are going to get blotted out. Either our names are going to get blotted out, which we don't want, or our sins get blotted out, which is what we want. Can we say amen to that? So we definitely want our sins to be blotted out rather than our names. So the question is, how then can this take place? Revelation chapter three. In Revelation, the third chapter, I want you to see what the Bible says. It lets us know how our names can remain in the book of life. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter three, let us consider the text. And I hope you don't mind studying. I'm here to study with you. I want us to turn text by text and we really want to make sure we know what we believe. We know what we're talking about. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter three, we're now considering verse five. In Revelation three and verse five, it says, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. If we want our names to remain in the book of life, then it means by default, our sins must be blotted out of the book of life. The only way that can happen is the Bible says we must overcome. Are you following that? Is it sensible? So God says, listen, in these very last moments of verse history, there is a healing process that's taking place as it relates to the wound that the beast suffered so long ago. When that wound is completely healed, which quite honestly, according to the prophetic landscape, is right around the corner. I cannot give you a day. I cannot give you an hour, but I can tell the season. And the same way that I can know that when it gets hot, I know summer is here. I know when it starts getting cold, the fall is coming. And when it gets freezing cold, the winter has arrived. The same way that I can tell the season is the same way God says we should pay attention to the season of the prophetic climate. And God is trying to help us understand we are in the season of the time in which the wound of the beast is soon to be healed. And this is not a time to play games with your soul salvation. 
This is not a time to play games and act like we're all right when really we're all wrong. This is a time that we have to do some serious heart assessment and truly ask the question and wait on God for the answer. Is everything truly well between myself and my savior? This is serious, brothers and sisters. Time is almost finished and everything in the world is showing us and everything in the church is showing us. That time is truly almost finished. Whatever we must do, we must do it quickly without delay. The Bible says in Psalms 119, turn there with me. The Bible says in Psalms 119th division, watch the words of God carefully, brothers and sisters. God is speaking to your heart today. In Psalms 119th division, the Bible makes it very clear that when God speaks to you and when God speaks to me and when he imparts his heavenly instructions, he does not want us to do what the foolish virgins did. You know what the problem was with the foolish virgins? They were not hypocrites, but the problem with the foolish virgins was that they were tremendous procrastinators. They were not hypocrites. But they were procrastinators. They knew what was supposed to be done, but they kept having this attitude of tomorrow. I'll get it done tomorrow. I'll get it done next week. I'll get it done next month. I'll get it done next year. They kept putting off what God called them to experience today. And they kept putting it off until tomorrow, until one day they woke up and it was eternally too late. The Bible says in Psalms, the 119th division, notice what it says in verse 60. Remember this text carefully. It says in Psalm 119, 60, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Whatever God tells you to do, do not delay. Make haste. Move quickly. Do not procrastinate. Obey what God says. Now, I thought about this. There's going to be a group that's going to have their names remain in the book of life. There's going to be a group that is also going to have their names blotted out and therefore their sin remains on the record. And as a result of that, they'll be eternally lost. And I thought to myself, between the seal of God and mark of the beast concept, what really is the dividing line of how we can experience one or the other? And it's almost super simple. Go to the book of Romans 6. And I want you to see this. Why is it that so many people, and unfortunately, I have to tell you that the majority of the people, even in the church, are going to receive this mark of the beast. They're going to worship the beast. They're going to wonder after the beast. Why is it that that's going to happen? The Bible says it very clearly in Romans, the sixth chapter. You see, we read earlier in Romans 13, or Revelation 13, we saw that the, the, the beast power is going to do all that it can to try to force people. That's why I kept saying cause, cause, cause. The word cause means to force. And they're gonna try to force people to worship against their will. And they're gonna, of course, put out various threats. They're gonna say, listen, if you don't do it, you will not be able to buy or sell. So your eating abilities, your regular way of living, of course, will be challenged. And then it even says, and then whoever does not do it, they will even be killed. So that means our lives will be threatened. And the question is, do you love Jesus enough to lose your job? Do you love Jesus enough to lose your life? Do you love Jesus enough that you'd be willing to give everything and you can have the attitude like the Apostle Paul that you can have the world, but give me Jesus? The question is, has your love relationship with Jesus Christ become that real? Has it become that possible? It's easy to join choirs and sing, oh, we love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. It's easy to come to family worship and say, oh, how I love Jesus. And we can go name by name. Oh, child, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, I love Jesus. And we know how to sing the songs, but we are going to come to a time that we're going to come face to face with our proclamations and professions. We're going to come face to face with a time. Do I really love you, Lord? And the question is, do you love him even when it's inconvenient, even when it means that we might have to lose even? our own lives. The Bible shows the dividing line of how we can know those who will ultimately receive either mark of the beast and their names are blotted out or the seal of God and their sins are blotted out. What is the dividing line? It's in Romans 6. The Bible says in Romans 6 and verse 16, it gives the key right here. It says in Romans 6 and verse 16, and if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Romans 6, 16, know ye not to, that to whom ye what? To whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. It's going to be about who do you yield to? 
God is making calls right now to his heart. He's calling you and he's calling me. The question is, will you yield? Those who yield, God will be rec- God will recognize them as his servants. But the devil is also making calls and he's making appeals to yours and my heart. And when we yield, we testify that we are his servants. So the way that the polarization in the last days is going to work is that we are going to soon and very soon know the people of God versus the people of the enemy. And it's all going to be based on who do you yield to? Who do you and I yield to? I remember I was reading a quotation. It's a very powerful quotation. It's in one of the books that we have been blessed to be given to as a movement, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's called Volume 5 of the Testimonies to the Church. And it's on page 81 that Ellen White made a very profound statement of why so many people will bow down to the beast and his image and receive his mark. It says, the time is not far distant. When the test will come to every soul, it says the mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Now, here's where it all comes in. And this is why we're going to have a very serious study today. How is it that so many people end up with this mark of the beast? How can somebody be convinced that God's Sabbath day is false and that Sunday is true when some of us are second and third generation Seventh-day Adventists? How is it that all of this is going to come to pass? Well, here's what it says. It says, those who have step by step, I'm talking about people who unfortunately received the mark of the beast. It says, those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. I want you to think about that. Did you know that the day to day decisions that you're making and I'm making right now is literally telling if I'm on the road to the mark of the beast or the road to the seal of God? The day to day decisions that you and I make right now is literally testifying as to which road we're on, either the road that leads to the mark of the beast or the road that leads to the seal of God. I repeat the quote, the time is not far distant when the test is going to come to every soul. It says the mark of the beast will be urged upon us and those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. Let me finish the quote. It says, rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. It is the day-to-day decisions that you and I make right now that determines our not only temporal, but eternal future. And the question is, when you look at worldly customs, when you look at worldly demands, what kind of decisions are you making? You know, I, I I like a gospel that's practical. I like it when I can measure my walk with God. And there are ways that we can know if we're closer or further away from the Lord. And the question is, how do you go about making your decisions every day? Every day, I don't care if you're black or white. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're American or from the UK or from some other country. The one thing we all have in common is we make decisions every day. We make decisions as to what we wear. We make decisions on to what we eat. We make decisions on what we listen to. We make decisions on what we watch. We make decisions on where we work. We make decisions on who we're going to marry. We make decisions on all sorts of stuff every day. This is the common line between humanity is every day we make decisions. And the question is, how do you make your decisions? Do you make it by the demands of the world? You see, right now, the world is making a demand. The world is making a very clear demand. The world demands that if you believe these fundamental Christian Bible teachings of one man to one woman in marriage and God will not accept anything else. The worldly demand is you better change that position or you will suffer persecution. And I wonder how many so-called Christians and so-called Protestants will actually surrender their belief in the Bible and their belief in God. 
because the world demands that they change their position. There are worldly customs that are constantly plaguing the people of God. The Bible teaches us that when we get dressed, we're supposed to represent that of saints. That when people see us, they should see people that represent the principles of holiness. The question is, when I decide to put my clothes on as a young man, today we got young men that think that they look good when they don't comb their hair. When they let their pants hang off their backside. When they begin to look like a bunch of thugs from a hip hop video. There are young men. And oh, it's not just black. I've seen white and I've seen Asian. I've seen every culture that's imitating this thing. So don't nobody think I'm beating up just on my black people. I'm talking about all people. This poison has affected all of our youth. And today it seems like young men don't even know what it is to be a young man. Because we have allowed that worldly custom to take possession of our minds and we actually think it's cool to look like a gangster. But brothers and sisters, I said looking like men. Did you know that today sometimes you don't know the man from the woman? The worldly custom has now made it comfortable and even popular that men no longer want to be men. That men decided, I don't want to be a man anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and change who I am. And they actually, the world actually applauds this and will give rewards for it. These are worldly customs. But we have a lot of young men that are yielding to this. There are young ladies that there was a time that a young woman understood what it was to be a woman of chastity, a woman of reserve, to understand that, yes, she has a beautiful body, but it was designed to be kept a secret until the man privileged to be her husband can unlock the code and see inside the secret. But today you got women today that think that it's beautiful. They think that it's wonderful that they can reveal their bodies. They can let the world and every pervert, both in the world and in the church, get a look at their anatomy and physiology. And they think that this is something that is virtuous. Brothers and sisters, or shall I say, dear sisters, please go back to the word of God and once again find your value. God wanted you to understand that you are not doing yourself or your fellow man a favor when you decide to reveal the secrets of your temple that God desires to dwell and you begin to go ahead and let everybody see it. It gives an image of harlotry. Now, listen, that's not me saying that. That's the Bible. Go to Proverbs 7. If you look at what Proverbs 7 says, you'll watch it carefully. There are worldly customs that have plagued the people of God that we have to get back to the blueprint of God's scripture and realize this is not acceptable, not for the child of God. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the seventh chapter, and watch the text carefully now, Proverbs 7. If you look at Proverbs 7, consider verse 10. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the seventh chapter, it says right there in verse 10, it says, and behold, there met him a what? Woman with the what? A tire of an harlot. Now, according to the verse, was the woman a harlot? No, it says her what? Her clothing was. Did you know that clothing in the scripture, clothing has personality? Clothing sends messages. And God understood this, and therefore he said, behold, there was a woman who was walking around, and she was given the message of harlotry by the way she was dressed. Sisters, it is possible that you might have a pure mind that loves God, but by your clothing, you can give a message that contradicts your own mindset. And God wants you to understand, don't yield to these worldly customs, because listen, if every new fashion comes out, you're saying, I got to get it. If every new worldly demand says, oh, I got to have it. If every new worldly demand says, well, I guess we need to accept it. Believe it or not, if we had that kind of mentality and we're yielding to all the latest fashions, yielding to every single demand, if we're constantly yielding, we are on the road to receiving the mark of the beast. And we don't even realize it. Satan has set up a master game plan. He wants to make sure that you and he wants to make sure that I stay away from this book called the Bible. It's all right to be spiritual. It's all right to even call yourself a Christian. It's even okay to show up at church. Just don't, don't, don't live by this book. Satan does not care if you show up to church for the rest of your life. He does not care if you tell everybody, I am third generation Seventh Day Adventist. He could care less. But the day that you and I make that decision to say, you know what? I've made a lot of decisions in my life. 
And I can see that I am not qualified to lead my life because my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And the day that we realize, you know what, Lord, I have made a mess out of my life, but by your grace, I'm going to actually do what Jesus said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but I'm going to live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. It is when we make this decision, that's when the host of hell trembles. Because Satan knows that is the generation that he's afraid of. And that is the climate of the world right now. The world is spiritual, but they're not biblical. And we got to get back to this blueprint because a lot of us are making decisions every day and we don't even realize how many of our decisions are based on worldly custom and worldly demands. And it's leading us to eventually receive ultimately the mark of that beast. And therefore, I believe we need to do a nice study on guidance when making decisions. I believe that we are living in a time that we need to know how to make decisions ourselves. You see, God told us something, and this, is, this would be, I wish you had it out earlier, but this would especially be the time to take out your pen and paper. We're gonna study today. I wanna give you the gems that by God's grace can help you in every day of practical living on how to make decisions, because every day you make decisions. It is by default, no matter what, you make decisions. And guess what? Even when you don't make a decision, you made a decision. You understand that? So we can't run from it. We can't avoid it. So I believe if I got to make decisions, either I'm going to do it God's way or I'm going to do it my way. Now, brothers and sisters, let me ask you this. And I'm just asking you honestly. If somebody came to your home and knocked on your door and, you know, they knocked on your door and they said, hello, I am a very deceitful man above all things and I am very wicked. Uh, can I come inside your house? How many of you would let that guy in your house? Now watch this. If somebody came to you and said, hello, I, I, you know, I am a very deceitful man and I am desperately wicked. Uh, could you please give me the uh, account numbers to your bank? How many of you would give that man your account number? You wouldn't give it to him, right? Because you know I'd be crazy. If the brother's going to be crazy enough to tell me that he's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, then I'm not going to trust him with anything, Right? The Bible says, brothers and sisters, in Jeremiah 17, please turn there with me. I know some of us are familiar with it, but turn there. God has a declaration he needs us to understand. In Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, notice what the Bible says. It is so simple, brothers and sisters. Watch this. In Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, what does the word of God say to us? In Jeremiah 17, right there in verse 9, look at what it says. It says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked, who can know it? Now, brothers and sisters, God is literally telling us, you know how people say, God knows my heart. You ever see people do that? They say, well, you know, they make whatever decision they make and they say, well, God knows my heart. You're right. He knows our heart so well, he wrote about it. And God said, our heart, your heart, my heart. He says, our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If we would not trust the man that confesses that in our homes, if we would not trust the man that confesses that to have access to our bank accounts, why in the world would we trust our own heart to make decisions for our future? God says, why would you do that? That is just as illogical and nonsensical as letting some person in your house that admits it. God says that's the reality of your condition and my condition. And I believe that our great challenge is we don't believe God. I believe that. I think our challenge is, Lord, I really don't believe what you said. I don't really think my heart's that bad. I think I'm all right. Well, God has a name for that disease. You know, that's a disease. That's a disease, brothers and sisters. God has a name for it. You know what the disease is called? It's called Laodicea. That disease called Laodicea has horrible symptoms. Let me show you the symptoms. Go to Revelation 3. You see, the, the disease of Laodicea, we, we're wondering about cancer. We talk about cancer is the number one killer. Heart disease is the number one killer. Laodicea is the number one killer. Let me show you Laodicea. Watch this. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, it says right there, as we consider this issue of Laodicea, this is what God says about it. God says in Laodicea, in verse 17, God says in Laodicea, in Revelation 3, verse 17, it says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and I don't need anything, not even God. This is the symptoms of the disease of Laodicea. But what does God say is the reality of those who are stricken with this disease? He says, 
but thou knowest not that thou art what? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And the question is, do you accept your diagnosis? You know, it's possible that a doctor could say you have cancer. And you know, some people go into denial. You ever seen people do that? The doctor diagnoses you, says, I'm sorry, but you have a terminal disease. And they say, no, I don't. No, no, I don't have that. And they just walk away and they try to think that ignoring the disease makes it go away. Those are people who not only die, but they die quick. We have to make sure that we don't adopt that worldly attitude when it comes to spiritual things. God has diagnosed you. God has diagnosed me. He says, you and I, we are stricken with this disease called Laodicea and it has horrible side effects. And therefore, the Lord says, but I want you to know that I have a remedy. See, God is different from the medical world. The medical world will tell you, you have cancer, but the medical world will also say, but we don't have a cure. God says, oh, you have Laodicea, a deadly disease. But God says, but praise God, I have a cure. God says in Revelation 3 and verse 18, that's that blessed cure. It says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. God says, I have a remedy, that if you receive my remedy, he says, I will literally cure you from the disease of Laodicea. God wants us to understand that it all begins with your decisions. You and I are going to make decisions even today at the conclusion of this sermon. Everybody's going to make a decision. But God wants you to make the right one. So what are some practical steps that can help us? Number one, Proverbs 4. Let's talk about some practical steps that can help us in making right decisions. Proverbs 4. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the fourth chapter, how can God help us to make right and wise decisions? Proverbs 4. There is something that is principal, something that is paramount, something that God wants us to have above and beyond many other things. And I want you to see what he says here in Proverbs 4. And verse 7. And when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 and verse 7, it says wisdom is the what thing? Wisdom is the principal thing. So if there's one thing that God wants you to have, he wants you to get what? Wisdom. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. One of the first things we need to recognize is that I have to make decisions every day. Now, I can either make wise decisions or foolish decisions. The goal of God is that he wants you to make wise decisions versus foolish ones. So therefore, the Lord says, I want you to understand that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, I want you to start getting wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. Wisdom is not only the obtaining of knowledge, but wisdom is also a practical application of the knowledge obtained. So that's why I like wisdom. Wisdom is something that not only you learn and understand, but you know how to activate it. You know how to implement it. So God says you need wisdom because every day you make decisions and it's always going to go down one of typically two roads. Either it's going to be a wise decision or a foolish decision. Now, you don't want to make foolish decisions because I want you to see what would happen. Go to Ecclesiastes 7. I'm going to show you that there's something that could happen if we were to make foolish decisions. And God doesn't want you to make foolish decisions. And I'm going to show you why. There are many reasons why, but this is one reason that I'm going to show you here. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, I want you to see what God shows us as it relates to why he does not want you to make foolish decisions. Either we make wise or foolish, God wants you to make wise decisions. It says in the book of Ecclesiastes 7, notice what it says in verse 17. And if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, it says right there in verse 17. It says, be not over much wicked, neither be thou what? foolish for why wilt thou what die when before thy time that's what can happen when you make foolish decisions when you and I make foolish decisions it can literally cancel out our lifespan in other words God may have wanted you to live longer did you know not everybody that dies died because it was their time you know, if you look back at Ecclesiastes 3, it does say there's a time to be born and a time to die. But it is possible you can die before your time. How? By doing foolish things, the scripture says. So this is why you do not want to do foolish things. I believe one of the great studies that you and I should do is understand what God calls foolish. Because if we do it, the Bible says it can have such a permanent effect on us that it can actually cancel out our lives before we were supposed to turn in our clock. So God says, you need wisdom. 
You need wisdom. Why? Because you have to make decisions every day. And either you make wise decisions or what? Foolish ones. And we see there can be some bad ramifications when we make foolish decisions. So God wants us to understand you need to start learning how to make wise decisions. Now, the good news is if you say I'm not wise. As I look back at my life, I made tons of foolish decisions. And if you're saying you're in that case, I got good news for you. Go to James one. Good news. I like giving good news. I'm not a bearer of bad news. I like good news. So notice what the Bible says in James 1. If we find ourselves in a place where we're saying, you know what? I do not make wise decisions. I can look back at my life and I made a bad decision when it came to this, that, and the other. And we have to understand that God says, all right, well, going forward, this is what you can do. It's a practical instruction. It's found in James chapter 1. The Bible says in the book of James chapter 1, we're going to consider verse 5. The Bible says in James 1, notice what it says as we consider verse 5. The Bible says in James 1 and verse 5, if any of you what? If you lack wisdom, what is God's instruction? Let him ask of God that giveth to how many men? How does he give it? Liberally. It says who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. Isn't that wonderful? So even if you can look at your life and you can say, Lord, I've made tons of foolish decisions. I've made tons of unwise decisions. God says you can put a stop to it today. God says you have to recognize you lack it. And then he says, now I want you from this day forward for the rest of the days that you have breath coming out of your nostrils. He says, I want you to come to me and I want you to ask me. The Bible actually says something very important about this asking concept. Go to James 4 and let me show you. If you look at James 4, notice what it says in verse 2. And this is why you got to ask him. You can't just think that God is just going to send it just because you need it. God wants you to learn to depend on him. So notice what it says in James 4 and verse 2. This is how serious asking is. James 4, 2 says, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye what? Have not because you? So there are some things in life you will not get if you don't ask. You understand that? You have not because you ask not. So if you know I lack wisdom, I constantly make foolish decisions. I am constantly making decisions that I see my life suffering perils for it. Then God says, that's all right. Wisdom is the principal thing. That's what you need. But he says, but now what I want you to do is if you lack it, come to me and ask for it. And God says, and I'll give it to you in abundance. So this is where it begins. But then there's point number two, Psalm 66. The first point in proper decision making is we must understand we need wisdom. And if you don't have it, go to God and you can ask for it. But now point number two, in your pursuit now to go to God and ask him for all these things, meaning you're communicating. If you're asking God for something, you're communicating with him, right? Well, let's make sure we don't allow something to take place that will block the communication. Psalm 66. The Bible says in Psalms, the 66th division. Notice what it says as we consider verse 18. The Bible says in Psalm 66, and now we're going to look at verse 18. This is an important one. Psalm 66 and verse 18. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, what does the Bible say? He will not hear me. So if we're going to start making a lifestyle of asking God for wisdom to make right decisions, we must understand you cannot regard iniquity in your heart. You got to be willing to confess all known sin and forsake all known sin. You got to be willing to say, if I know I'm living with my man and he is not my husband and we are having premarital sex, you got to be willing to end that relationship and leave that house and get your life right so that God can start answering your prayers. If you know I'm living with a woman, she is not my wife, and I am living and I'm having premarital sex with her, etc., then you and I have to understand we have to break that relationship. We have to be willing to walk out of that house and no longer live in this type of environment. And then God will start working on your behalf to start answering your questions. But if you and I think that we can just go ahead and live and do what we want and live any type of iniquitous or sinful lifestyle and God is just going to hear my prayers and answer me anyway, I want you to turn to Proverbs 28 and you pay close attention to what Proverbs 28 says. I remember I was dancing in the hip hop industry and I worked for an artist by the name of Heavy D. He is now deceased. And I remember when I was working for Heavy D that uh, they called me 
And they said, Dwayne, we want you to work for him. And this is when I was early in my Adventist years. I was Seventh-day Adventist, and, uh, and I did not grow up Seventh-day Adventist. I heard the Advent message when I was 20. So when I accepted the message, I was already in the hip-hop and R&B industry. So I was working with all these different hip-hop and R&B artists. So when I uh, got a call, I accepted the Advent message. I decided to honor God and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, what happened was I remember I got a phone call from Heavy D and he said, listen, I need you to come and I need you to do some work for me in California. And I said, well, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to change my lifestyle, et cetera. He didn't want to hear that. So he just said, look, I will pay you this amount of money. And he offered a handsome amount of money and that money I coveted. So I sold out on God and I said, I will go. And I decided to go ahead and dance. And I danced every Friday night and I was feeling terribly guilty. It's something about the word of God. When the word of God takes residence in your mind and then you go ahead and try to just deliberately silence your conscience and practice your sin anyhow, it's not the same. There's something, there's an agitation in your mind. You, there's something in your mind that says, I know this is wrong. And you try to enjoy the moment, but it's not the same. Well, that's what I was going through. So Friday night after Friday night, I'm dancing, I'm performing, everybody's screaming and shouting and they're praising me and lifting me up. I'm making tons of money, but I am not happy. And I remember one night I said, Lord, I miss worshiping you. I was in Beverly Hills. I was in a very plush hotel. They always give you the best in the entertainment industry. And so I'm in this extremely beautiful, extravagant hotel and I'm there and I'm just walking through this hotel and I'm sad. I'm not happy. And here it is that I just said, Lord, I just feel like worshiping you. Now, I used to come from the Pentecostal church. And in the Pentecostal church, I had a habit. I used to have this habit that whenever it was time for worship, I would just open up my Bible with my eyes closed, put my finger on the text, and then that's what I would meditate on. So I remember that I'm in California. I'm missing God. I literally am missing him. And I said, Lord, I just want to worship you tonight. I miss you. I knew Saturday morning I'm going to be on the stage dancing. I knew that I'm going to be doing something that is contrary to God's will. I'm going to be sinning against God and breaking his Sabbath day. But I missed God. And I said, Lord, I just want to worship you. So I decided I'm just going to go ahead and open up my Bible. And I put my finger on the text that Friday night. And I looked at the verse and it was at Proverbs 28 and verse 9. What does it say? This is how I discovered this verse for the first time in my life. It says in Proverbs 28 and verse 9, it says, He that turneth his e away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is abomination. I saw that text for the first time in my life. And I looked at that and I said, I can't worship. Because I knew that I am planning on sinning against God tomorrow morning. And yet I'm trying to honor him and have all this. And God says, he who turns away his ear from hearing my law, even his prayer. It's not that God says, I won't hear your prayer. He actually says, I'm offended by your prayer. An abomination is something offensive. This is how much God hates iniquity. Iniquity is not just sin. It's premeditated sin. It's like I know that it's Sabbath right now, but I know my girl is waiting for me tonight and we're going to do what we normally do. There's some young people in the Seventh-day Adventist church that make plans like this. Not here in the UK, of course. But in the US, they do that. They actually will go ahead and come to church on Sabbath, even though they're planning to go to the movies tonight. And then after the movies, come back to the house. And to jump back into the bed of fornication. And they plan these things. God says, when you think like that and when you function like that, God says, it's not only that I don't accept your worship. God says, your worship is offensive to me. I closed up my Bible. I did not have worship that night. And I flew back to the U.S. And I remember I called them and said, I can't do it anymore. They said, are you crazy? You're about to make thousands of dollars. Listen, these people would pay you $30,000 in a month. I mean, you're talking big money. They said, are you crazy? Are you going to make this? You're going to make that? And all these things. And here it is that I said, it's over. I couldn't break the heart of God anymore. I said, Lord, I can't do it. I wonder if you're there yet. You see, some of us, we know there are some sins that are not even struggles for us. Ladies and gentlemen, a struggle is when you go like this. That's a struggle. Some of us, as soon as sin shows up, sin says, get over here. And it just pulls us. And there's no struggle. So some of us are lying to our own selves and we will say, oh, I'm struggling with this sin. And we're not even struggling. 
We are simply yielding. Every time that sin shows up, it's just, whoop, we get sucked into it. God says, listen, if you're living that kind of life, God says, that can't work. It's decision time, brothers and sisters. So the Bible makes it clear. Yes, if you lack wisdom, God says, come to me. I will give it to you. But God says, but when you come to me, you got to come clean. God says, you got to let me take away first all this filth out of your life. And then I can start imparting the wisdom that can enable you to make righteous decisions. Amen. All right, good. Now I want you to go to Psalms 32. Step three. Step three. In Psalms 32, God gives us another step. We're talking about how to make right decisions. In Psalms, the 32nd division, the Bible says this, Psalms 32. God says in Psalms, the 32nd division, and he says right there, as we look at verse eight, Psalms 32, verse eight, if you're there, please say amen. God gives a promise. He says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. God promises when you confess your sins, when you acknowledge your guilt, when you acknowledge your need for me, and you come to me and ask me for wisdom, God says, I promise you, I will start guiding you. He's going to instruct you. And guess what? He doesn't just guide you. Guess how often he guides you? Go to Isaiah 58. If you're a Bible marker, you want to write next to uh, uh, Psalms 32, 8, you want to write down Isaiah 58, 11. If you mark your Bible, put down Isaiah 58, 11 next to Psalms 32, verse 8. Watch Isaiah 58, 11. How often will God guide me? Oh, what a blessed promise. Isaiah, the 58th chapter. Watch this. In Isaiah, the 58th chapter, the Bible says, as we consider Isaiah 58, and we're going to now look at verse 11. How often will God guide me? The Bible says in Isaiah 58 and verse 11, it says, and the Lord shall guide thee. How often? Continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Now, in short, I'm going to give you this. There's a, there's a nice long way to do this, but, you know, I'm watching the time, of course. I want you to write this down for those of you who do not have a problem with any of the writings of Ellen White. If you have a problem with Ellen White's writings and you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you have a bigger problem than you think. Let me repeat that. I'm going to give you something right now for those of you who do not have a problem with the writings of Ellen White. But if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, you're not Adventist, and I understand. But if you are a Seventh-day Adventist and you have a problem with the writings of Ellen White, you have a bigger problem than you think. We are told, know this for a certainty. One thing is certain, that those Seventh-day Adventists who will begin to slight the writings of the testimonies of God will come under Satan's banner. So there's something wrong with us if we are Seventh-day Adventists, but we're talking about we don't like Ellen White's writings. There's something wrong with us, not her, us. You need to go back and read it again. You need to renew your covenant with God and understand what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. If you are not a Seventh-day Adventist and you're here with us and you're saying, well, I don't know about this woman. I've read websites. I'll tell you what. Maybe you want to pause from reading the website. Why don't you read her books for yourself? And then you can find out if her writings were inspired or not. But for those of us who are okay with Ellen White's writings, I want you to write this down. This is volume five of the Testimonies to the Church, page 512, 512. Volume five of the Testimonies to the Church, page 512. And why do I give that? Because it says there are three ways that God speaks to us. Three ways. It says, one, he speaks to us through his word. So when God says, I'm going to guide you, we have to understand the way he's going to guide us is through his word. That's just one way. He's going to guide us through his word. So what that means now is when you say, ooh, there goes a nice outfit. Boy, I want to buy that. Something in your mind should say, wait. What does the word say? What are some principles? So it'll say 1 Timothy 2.9. It's going to say, women should dress in modest apparel. So if you can look in the mirror and you can say, hmm, my cleavage is showing. My skirt's very high. When I sit down, it's possible you can even see my underwear. And it hugs against my body and accentuates all the curvature of my body. If you know that you, all those things could be seen, I can assure you that is not modest apparel. You understand? Okay. Now listen, here's the good news. When I read John 3 and verse 19, it says, this is condemnation. That light is coming to the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
I believe that when we discover that we're doing something that is not according to God's will, God does not condemn you. Condemnation comes when light comes to us. We see the light. We understand the light. But we say, I don't want that light. I reject that light because I love my darkness. When we have that attitude, yes, you are condemned before God. But if you come to a place and you're hearing God's truth and you're saying, I've never heard it like this before. I didn't know. But this is the word of God. And I'm willing to do what God says, even though we might have been doing the wrong thing. God does not condemn you. So I am here to let you know, I am not seeking to give a message of condemnation. I'm here to give a message of education. You understand that? There's a difference. What you and I do with the education will determine if you will be condemned or not. So if you can look in the mirror and you can literally say, my backside is all over the place. My breasts are out before the naked eye. My undergarments can be seen when I'm sitting down or whatever the case may be. If you know that, brothers and sisters, you and I need to understand I am wearing the garments that represent harlotry and this does not please God. And I need the power of God to make a serious change. I need to start making some different decisions on my clothing. You understand that? That will come from a heart that loves Jesus. God wants us to understand that this is his principle. So we're talking about living by the word. So now when I start saying, ooh, look at Kanye, look at Kim Kardashian, look at all the great artists and look at how much they deck themselves with makeup and jewelry and all these things. All we got to do is say, you know what? I want to get some of that latest makeup. I want to get some of that latest earring, some of that latest neck chain or whatever the case may be. When you start thinking about that, all you got to do is go back and say, wait. This is the new life we're living now. We're going to say, wait, before I put any earring on my ear, bracelet on my arm, or chain around my neck, before I do that, what does the word of God say? That's all you're doing. This is the lifestyle. This is living by the word. Now, when you go to Deuteronomy 7, I believe God has an answer. So let's go to Deuteronomy 7. When you go to Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, God has an answer. So let's look at God's answer in Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter. Oh boy, I see some great jewelry. I want to put that jewelry on. Listen, brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that the Bible talks about ornaments, but it says that you and I can wear the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price, First Peter says. So it's not that God is against ornaments. He's against these artificial ornaments. He wants us to put on the eternal ornaments of his character. Because I'm gonna let you know something right now, sisters and brothers, that's where true beauty lies. In Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, the Bible is clear in verse 25 and 26. Oh, watch the text. It says the graven images. Oh, let's pause before you go. This is the story of the children of Israel as they were going into Canaan land. What was happening is they were about to possess the land Canaan because remember, God promised it. So as they were getting ready to enter into the promised land, God says, you're going to run into two things when you enter Canaan. One is going to run into their women and their men. So God says, do not intermarry with these unbelievers. So you read that in the previous verses of Deuteronomy 7. But now God is instructing them on what they should do when they see the idols of the Canaanites. So here's what he says in Deuteronomy 7, 25. He says, the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. So God says, when you see those statues, he says, I want you to burn them with fire. Get rid of them. But then watch the next sentence. It not only says burn the graven image with fire, it says thou shalt not desire the what? Silver or gold that is on them. Stop. What's the them? The idol. Oh, wait a minute. So then that means the idol is different or separate from the silver and gold that's on it. Is that right? What do you call the silver and gold that rests on the idols? What's that called? Jewelry. You understand that? That's the jewelry. That's why if you go to a Chinese restaurant here in uh, England, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, what do you typically see resting nearby the cashier register somewhere? You're going to see that big Buddha, right? And you're going to see the Buddha and he got his big belly out and his head and everything. And then he's going to have those earrings And he's going to have those chains and he's going to have the rings. He's going to have all that jewelry on him. Is that right? Oh, if you go to an Indian restaurant, you go to the Indian restaurant. What do you always see in the Indian restaurant? You're going to see 
Human body, animal head, right? And when you typically see animal head, human body, what's on its ears, its neck, its arms, its finger? What is on it? Jewelry. So the Bible understood that it was typical of pagan practice that whenever they erected idols, they always decked it with jewelry. So God is making it crystal clear, plain. He's saying the idol, I want you to burn it. The jewelry that's on it, do not take it unto yourself. Notice what the rest of the verse says. It says the graven images of their God shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is what? An abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. God says, I don't want my people decorating themselves with jewelry. That's God's position. And it's consistent in Deuteronomy 7. It's consistent in Isaiah 3, 16 through 26. It's consistent in Exodus 32. It is consistent in 1 Peter 3 and verses 3 to 8. It is consistent in 1 Timothy 2, 9. It's consistent throughout scripture when God says, you're my people. I don't want my people decking themselves with these artificial adornments. So now when I go to the word, I'm saying, Lord, I realize I can't make wise decisions. The best way to make decisions is according to your word, because you promise you will guide me continually. But the way that God speaks is through his word. So I now have to go to the word. Sisters, you will save yourself from a thousand perils when you test the next cute guy by the word. It is possible that a brother could look good, but looks have a way of fading over a period of time. And then you're stuck with a character. And if that character is not pretty like his face, your marriage that you thought was going to be heaven can become like hell. So what God wants is any man you meet, he has to be tested by the word. Are you a man of God? Brothers, when you see that sister, it doesn't matter how pretty she is. And it doesn't matter how nice her face and hair look and all of that other stuff. You want to go ahead and test that sister by the word. And you want to say, okay, let's see. Does she fit the image of a virtuous woman? I mean, I'll tell you right now. I mean, thank the Lord. Hey, it's 18 years that I've been married. So I am locked in happily. Amen. But if I was single and you coming up to me and if I could see all your body and stuff, that's immediate disqualification. You just killed your chance. As a man of God, you, you just killed your chance. If, if you flashing your body all around and everything else, as a man of God, looking for a woman that I can go ahead and marry, uh-uh. Disqualify. I don't care how nice your personality is. I mean, uh-uh. If you go, because listen, when a man gets married, he wants to cherish his sacred prize for him to see. He don't want the rest of the world seeing what is his. And you shouldn't want that either. So now our life is a life of living by the word. But I continue. In volume 5, 5, 12, it says God speaks to us through his word. Then it also says through the appeals of the Holy Spirit to your heart. What that means is that not only sometimes you, I know, I know you had to run into this. How many of you have ever run into a situation where you had to make a decision and you had more than one option and both options are in harmony with God's word? You ever ran into those type of situations? You ever ran into those decisions where literally I got to make a decision and you got to make a decision, but you don't know. You're saying this is OK with God and his word and this is OK, but I can't do both. And you don't know which direction to go. That's why we need the other phase of God speaking. God also speaks to the appeal of the Holy Spirit to the human heart. There will be something that we simply call it impressions. God will impress your mind to say This is the path that I want you to go. Even though you have two paths, three, four, five, maybe you have several paths that God approves of all of them. There's something that the spirit of God will speak to your mind and say, this is the specific path that I want you to go down. This is what's called the appeal of the Holy Spirit to the human heart. So this is another way that God speaks. Another one, the third one is called providential leadings. 
It seems like when you try to go here, the door is blocked. When you try to go here, the door is blocked. When you try to go here, the door is blocked. When you try to go here, the door is open. Providence led in this direction. Again, it's according to the word, but providential leadings. God will providentially lead you in a certain path that will ultimately lead to the joys and the experiences that God desires. Sometimes you're going to need to make decisions. We're winding down. Sometimes you're going to make decisions and you're going to need to fulfill Proverbs 11. Go there with me now. We're almost done. Proverbs 11. In Proverbs, the 11th chapter, it's another way you make decisions. Proverbs, the 11th chapter. And this one is going to be very, very important, brothers and sisters. Proverbs 11. And now we're going to look at verse 14. The Bible says in Proverbs, the 11th chapter, it says in verse 14, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Some decisions in life are going to require you to seek counsel. And God deliberately put in his word, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So there are going to be some decisions that you will make in life or need to make in life, and you may not know the best way to go. Maybe it's because of inexperience, lack of experience, or what have you. And therefore, God says, go seek godly counselors. Now, let me give you a balance to this, because some of us go to counselors that just have degrees but no wisdom. Let me repeat that. Some of us go to counselors that have degrees but have no wisdom. So you don't let a piece of paper alone qualify a man. I don't care what you graduated from. I want to know who governs your mind. Because Sigmund Freud, which taught so much apostasy and so much error in the name of psychology, I am scared of talking to any psychologist or psychotherapist if all of your philosophies go back to Sigmund Freud. So I need to know that you got thought processes that goes above some of his nonsense. You understand that? So therefore, we need to make sure that whenever you seek a human counselor, remember this statement. Psalms 119. Watch this one. In Psalms, the 119th division, look at verse 24. Psalms 119, verse 24. If you seek a human counselor that go is governed by this, you will never have to worry, I believe, as it relates to that person's counsel. What does it say in Psalms, the 119th division in verse 24? The Bible says, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. God says his testimonies, his words, the testimony of Jesus. God says his testimonies. We can also understand that the testimony of Jesus, did it go beyond the Bible? Yes. Under the writings of? Sister White. So we can say the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. When we go, if any human counselor counsels according to the counselors, then we can expect they're giving sound counsel. You understand that? So if you're going to go to a human counselor, make sure that their counseling is subject to God's counselors. If their counseling is according to God's counselors, then we don't have to be afraid. There's much more that could be said. My encouragement to you is very simple. We are living in the very last moments of earth's history. All the signs are pointing to the fact that probation is soon to close. God wants you to win. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to come home with him and live with him for eternity. But God makes a very important call. His call is found in his words. Joshua said, choose this day whom you shall serve. Elijah said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. Moses said in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, he said, I present before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. The decisions you make will determine your destiny. God does not arbitrarily save people. He presents himself. He presents his words. He shows you every reason under the sun of why you should choose him but he will not make you choose him. He leaves that decision with you. 
This is why the book Steps to Christ says, in page 47, everything depends on the right action of the will. Everything. Your future, your destiny depends on the decisions you make right now. And remember, if you're yielding and choosing worldly demands and conforming to worldly customs, and if, it's, if that is your lifestyle, even you can prophesy your future and it doesn't look good. God does not want you to be lost. He wants you to be saved. And salvation is a choice. I love the statement in Steps to Christ, page 48, where it says many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. She says they do not choose to be Christians. Brothers and sisters, today you have a choice. You have a privilege of choosing to be a Christian. And what is a Christian? A Christian is someone whose life is completely surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian is a soul who has made a decision like Jesus made, not my will, but thy will be done. A Christian is someone who understands I do not live by the calls of the flesh, but I live by the words of God. This is what it means to be a Christian when the climate of the world chooses to apostatize. We don't know what the decision will be next month. We don't know what will be decided at General Conference. We don't truly know what will happen in September when Pope Francis meets with Congress in the United States of America. But I believe that this year will be marked in history and choices are about to be made, brothers and sisters. And while everybody else wants to make all of their choices, you and I better make sure that we make the right choice. And no man can choose for you. You must make your choice for yourself to say, as for me and my house, regardless of what anybody says, we are going to serve the Lord. And if that is your decision that you are making, and you are looking to God to give you the power to choose him and his ways from this day forward for the rest of your life. If this is the choice that you are making, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet with me. I'm going to ask you to so signify that you're going to stand to your feet. And you're going to recognize, not by might, nor by power, but by God's spirit, saith the Lord, I am going to do what God wants. You know, one of the things I love about Christianity is God does not leave it to you to save you. God does not leave it to you to change you. You cannot change your heart. You cannot give to God its affections. But what you can do is you can choose to serve him. And when you serve him, he will then work in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. God will do for you what you never could do for yourself. That's the good news about Christianity. That's what I love about Christianity is God does not leave you by yourself. He says, I am responsible for making sure that you accomplish everything that I call you to do. All God's biddings are enablings. I've been to meetings where I've seen people come dressed inappropriately and they came back in the afternoon and they were dressed more conservatively they responded to the voice of God. I was in Singapore and I gave the message and a husband and a wife came down and they said, we're taking off our rings right now. They said, if these things offend God, we don't want to do anything that offends him any further. And they literally stripped themselves of these things. They said, I don't want to do anything. I've offended God the majority of my life. I want to spend the last few moments of my probation pleasing Jesus. Brothers and sisters, it's decision time. You and I have to make some serious decisions. Parents, you're going to have to look at what do you allow your children to read? You know, it's written of Voltaire in Child Guidance, page 196. It says, Voltaire, who was such a heathen. What we don't know is, do you know how he became a heathen? He was exposed to just one infidel poem. And when he read that one infidel poem, it affected his mind so bad that he gave up his belief on God and became one of the chief instruments of promoting heathenism and infidelity. And Ellen White says, 
oh, how many thousands will wake up in the resurrection on the wrong side and they will give credit to what they learned from Voltaire. Parents, not once don't let your children be exposed to error. Not once do you allow your children to be exposed to the things of this world that you can control. We can't control what people do out in the street when we're walking. I understand. But what goes on in your home, you control that. That is what God gave you. That's your home. No compromise. Be faithful. Trust God and watch him do miracles. Not only for you, but in you and through you for his glory. Why don't we seal the decisions we've made today with a word of prayer? I'm going to go to my knees to do that. If you can go to your knees with me, please do so. And if you can't go to your knees, just bow your heads where you are. But let's pray together as we seal the decisions we have made today. Father in heaven, we have erred. We have failed. We can look back at our lives and our choices and we can see that even things that we have sometimes blamed the devil for, it really was us. It was our choices. But I am so grateful that even when we make a mess of our own lives, your grace is so amazing that you still avail yourself to help us get cleaned up, to start all over again, and to finish the race perfectly because now we rest upon the strength of Jesus. Lord, thank you that you gave us this other chance today. I ask of you, please, bless every single one of my brothers and my sisters who have responded to your voice. Help us, dear God, to trust you, to love you, to live for you, and to experience every blessing that you have promised that comes in its train. And I pray that our lives will be better than how it was from this morning. And may we leave here truly different than when we came in and have a testimony of the goodness and greatness of God and your amazing faithfulness. Abide with us, keep us, and help us to remember now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty both now and forever. Amen.